My name is John Lavelle. I'm a professor of architecture at Pratt Institute in Brooklyn, New York. This is a lecture I gave to the Values Caucus at the United Nations in May 2015, titled Culture and Values, Where Values Come From. Well, my name is John Lavelle, and I'm Professor Pratt. I'll say more about myself, my slide uh, slides. Uh, I want to thank everybody for coming and Maybe there will be a hint in what I'm going to say that it will be pertinent to what's going on right now. Maybe, you know, get to some underlying values that will address that. So starting with my first slide, these two things look very different. And we'll see why in a minute. So just a bit about me. Studied at the University of Pennsylvania. Worked on some technology projects on grants relating to New York, did environmental sculpture in the 60s. I'm director of research for a project called TimeShip, which is a um, life extension cryonics research facility. I consult on for a company doing large-scale sculpture, uh, professor of architecture at Pratt Institute. I've done several books, and you can keep up on what I'm doing on my website, johnlobel.com. And in about three weeks, my uh, next book, Visionary Creativity, will be out, and it is, uh, it'll be on Amazon. And it's pertinent to what I'll be talking about today. So I want to start with um, rejecting a materialist look at cultural differences. So he's, he's trying to explain cultural differences through material differences, different ac different accesses to resources, different technologies. And I reject that. Uh, and I also reject, this is a current issue of New Scientist magazine, has an article on morality is rooted in the way societies get their energy. So between evolutionary psychologists and, you know, and analyzing cultures by their energy use, we're in a very materialistic age, and I feel that um, that's not going to be <clears throat> useful in understanding cultures. So I'm going to start with Plato's The Sophist that proposes a difference between the positions of the gods and the earth giants. And the gods hold that knowledge is universal, timeless, necessary, and certain. The earth giants hold that it's provisional, depends upon its context. And that's the position I'm going to take, what Nietzsche calls perspectivism. Who knows where this image comes from? The Matrix. <laughs> my students didn't know that. <laughs> the two movies my students know, Blade Runner and The Matrix. <laughs> they never heard of Gone with the Wind. So my contention is that cultures are symbolic entities. Each has a different inner psychology and different values. And we can understand a lot about a culture through its literature and its architecture. A culture begins by laying down its epic poems in its temple form, and that these establish the culture's worldview and the space, the parameters within which it can move. So we're going to look at uh, several. Why don't I skip over this, because we're going to look at each of these individually. But, well, maybe we'll go into a little bit. So. Across the Eurasian continent, there are five great culture fields, East Asian, China, Korea, Japan, which sees us as being a part of the flow of nature. South Asia, India, which holds that this world is an illusion and we should identify with uh, a transcendent oneness. The Middle East, which holds that the world was created by a creator who left an instruction book. Greece, which celebrated the individual, but subject to fate. And Western European, which celebrates an individual with an inner moral compass. So in the Middle East, the world was created by a creator who left instructions, and one should submit oneself to the society, and the self and the society to the creator. And we'll take as our <coughs> founding myth, uh, Job. So God and Satan are in a bar, and uh, Satan's, uh, God says to Satan, 
Behold my subject Job, look how he worships me. And what does Satan say? Of course, look at well, all the wealth and you know benefits you give him. Take that away and see what happens. God says you're on. So God allows Satan to destroy Job's wife, his children, his farm, his lands, his health, and ultimately the respect of others. And God then confronts Job and says to Job, Canst thou draw out Leviathan with a hook? Look at how great I am. Job says, I have heard of thee by the hearing of the ear, but now mine eye seeth thee. Wherefore I abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes. I bow down before you. <coughs> what would we say to somebody who did all that to us? <laughs> you sicko! <laughs> you kill my children to have some bet with Satan? And the world is encased under a vault of heaven. So this is sort of a Middle Eastern view of the world. This is a Western idea. This is not there. The idea that you should peek out beyond that. So the values for the Middle Eastern biblical traditions is to rehear and submit to the law of the Creator. If you want to figure out if something makes sense, doesn't make sense, you should do, you should not do, this is the system of references back to which you would use to make that determination. For Greece, we see the emergence of the individual, but subject to fate. So Prometheus steals fire from the gods, but also the arts and sciences <coughs> to give to humans. And what's the big danger? Why is Zeus teed off? so that humans should eventually supplant and replace the gods. You idiot! You're going to get us all killed off! <laughs> so Zeus punishes Prometheus by chaining him to a rock, and the eagle comes every day and eats out his liver, <clears throat> where he grows every night. Prometheus rails at his fate. And then we see the uh, Greek temple form as the uh, this Greek temple, which celebrates the separation of society from nature and the emergence of the individual from society symbolized in the freestanding columns. And so the value is to live with honor as an individual and accept one's fate. I'm going to see an objection to that shortly. In the West, the idea is that the creative and moral center is in the heart of each individual we're here to conquest infinite space and time and understand and control nature. So we'll take as our epic poems, the Arthurian romances. In one of them, the knights are gathered at the round table and the grail appears veiled. And one of the knights says, I propose that we go on a quest to see the grail unveiled. And it goes on to say, they thought it would be a disgrace to go forth in a group. So each entered the forest at a point he himself chose where it was darkest and there was no path or way. So I'll just jump ahead. I, um, uh, one of my Tibetan teachers, Lopsang Samton, famous sand painter, and we were doing a project at Pratt for a Tibetan cultural center in New York. So he agreed to come to the jury with two buddies all in there. Tibetan robes, you know, coming out to the school, made a real entrance. I'm driving him back to New York. He's very confused. He says, each student does their own project? It would never occur to him to, you know, wing it doing a sand painting. This was prescribed. It would be a major theological discussion to make any change in one of these sand paintings. So our key myth is that of Percival, who on a quest visits the castle of the fisher king who's been wounded, wound won't heal, and he is moved to say what ails you, the statement that would have healed the king. But suddenly he remembers a knight is not supposed to speak to a king until spoken to first. For the first time he does not act spontaneously, he acts by social norm. He fails the quest, he's turned away, and for many years he wanders, eventually he refines the castle asks the question, what ails you, heals the king, heals the land. 
So we are called on to each act out of our own inner sense of morality. So Huck Finn is ha- helping Jim escape, and he realizes this is a terrible sin he's committing. He's helping an escape slave. What did Miss Watson ever do to him? Uh, and the priest had told him this is wrong. School had told him this is wrong. And he says he knows he's going to go to hell, but he says, all right, then I'll go to hell. It was awful thoughts and awful words, but they were said. So we know that his inner judgment is more valid than that of the society. And then every movie. (laughs) See if you can think of a movie in which John Wayne in Stagecoach, Humphrey Bogart and the Maltese Falcon, uh, The Bourne Identity, Angelina Jolie and Salt, in every one of them, the protagonist is uh, acting against society out of their own judgment of what's right and wrong and ultimately doing the right thing. And then movies like Gattaca, Truman Show, Clockwork Orange, this incredible celebration of the fierceness of one's individual judgment. The Western temple form is, of course, the Gothic cathedral. Standing in the nave of this cathedral, it's obvious that it will be the descendants of the builders of this cathedral who will circle the globe and go into space. So there's something called the Needham question. Joseph Needham is a great scholar of China, born in 1900, died in 1995, and produced this encyclopedic set of volumes of studies of Chinese technology. And China had these incredible technologies, gunpowder, optics, paper, movable type, on and on and on. Giant flying machines that could take you aloft as early as 300 AD. The Needham question is, China was far in advance of Europe until the 1400s. Then Europe leapt ahead while China stagnated. Why? And the answer is, in the West, the individual was turned loose to make their own discoveries, the ability to pursue with less and less restrictions. Galileo was locked up, but that lessens. And to be rewarded through fame or fortune. So I say to my students, why would you spend two years eating pizza, sleeping under your desk, working on designing a social networking platform. Because if you win, you can sell it to Google for a billion dollars and pocket a hundred million personally. (laughs) You can benefit from this rather than getting executed for it. If you look at what happened in Western culture, so everybody can identify every one of the people in the first two rows except this guy. Who's this? That's Voltaire, that's Newton. So that's Newton, and then Einstein, Marie Curie. These are business people, so that's Steve. Who's this? A young Henry Ford. So this one's more difficult. So that's Voltaire. This is William Blake. This is John Bell, Bell's theorem. Totally took apart Einstein. This is Lynn Margulies. Shows that the... um, The entire Darwinian idea of natural selection is just totally wrong. It doesn't explain evolution. It's done done through symbiogenesis. And this is one of my symbiogenesis, that um, the fundamental unit is bacteria. 90% of the DNA in our bodies right now is bacterial DNA. Bacteria moves this DNA around in whole big chunks. And it's that wholesale movement of the bacteria which causes evolution, not slow natural selection. And then this is um, Stephen Wolfram, and my favorite quote of his, I think when I find the code that generates our world, it'll be about six lines. (laughs) And they're working to reprogram it. And then the ability of these people to form voluntary communities, the Royal Society, the Lunar Society, group of early British industrialists, including Wedgwood, the Mayflower Compact, and then um, de Tocqueville's observation of the voluntary societies formed in America. So this individual, how do you, how do you make one of those? 
and we start with a soul. So we just sort of zip through the history of Western art. Then we add a physical, anatomical, biological body. Then we add an inner psychology. And then the humanist notion that of God, man, and nature, man is central and the highest, and then uh, God is a function of the human imagination, and nature is subject to our understanding control, as opposed to a medieval notion of God being first and then creating man and then nature, the animals, to be subjugated and used by human beings. Now, if I say that's the Renaissance humanist notion, does this belie that? And we see God sending the spark of life to Adam. What is this? Does that remind you of anything? People were looking at this for 500 years before somebody suddenly noticed. It's a section of the human brain. God is within the human imagination. Michelangelo wasn't going to say that out loud, but uh, that's what he's saying. And then the human self in Raphael's School of Athens, we have philosophers, mathematicians, poets, painters, sculptors, mathematicians, scientists. These are all the parts of the Renaissance man, of a, a complete person. But it's lacking one thing, emotional depth, if you get that with the Baroque. So here in a Rembrandt self-portrait, the sorrows that he has accumulated uh, through the course of his life, death of his wife, the death of his child, etc. The celebration of the rational and the enlightenment, the romantic challenge to the enlightenment. You think your rationality can comprehend the depths of the human psyche or the mysterious powers of nature, the unconscious, and then the discovery and celebration of the ordinary person, and then finally a little bit of insecurity. And we've now <laughs> rounded out the Western individual, which, which is what the history of Western art does for us. You could do the same thing with Western literature. And a home for that person? There we go. So Palladio's Villa Rotunda is a Cartesian coordinates, X, Y, and then Z axis, for the human being to stand in the center. So if we say man is the measure of all things, slogan of the Renaissance borrowed from the Greeks, you need a place to stand to measure from. The zero point in your Cartesian coordinates and Western architecture provides that. So the values of this culture, to identify one's interests and act from it, to defy society when it's wrong, to understand and control nature from one's own judgment. East Asia, society should be in accord, the self should be in accord with society and the self and society should be in accord with the flow of nature and the flow of all things. So back to the Needham question, in the 1400s, China was far in advance of Europe. What happened? So it was not lack of technology or resources in the part of China. In the early 1400s, Admiral He sent out a whole series of expeditions circling much of the globe. This was, these were his ships. This is Columbus's ship. So you can't say that the Europeans circled the globe because they had a better technology. They were out there in bathtubs with paddles compared to what the Chinese had. Well, why didn't the Chinese circle and colonize the earth? Because there's nothing there worthwhile. Everything important is in the center, the imperial center surrounded by the royal domains, then the feudal princes, then the zone of pacification. Those are the people they, we've stomped. The zone of allied barbarians, those who we haven't stomped, but they're going to ally with us. And then the zone of cultural savagery. That's us. For the Chinese, there are five directions, north, east, south, west, and center. Say, Wait a minute. Center's not a direction. Center's an arbitrary point reference point from which you observe north, east, south, west. No, it's a direction. It's a place you can go to. The imperial center is a direction you can go to. It's fixed. In the west, we slay the dragon, symbol of nature's power. In China, you venerate the dragon. 
the flow of energies of the earth are understood and worked with. In Chinese medicine, illness is a blockage of the natural flows. Acupuncture will restore those natural flows. Your art building is like acupuncture to the earth. You have a geomancer do a study before you build your building. And so, whereas in the West, the individual dominates nature. In China, there are people here, but we don't notice them because they are, metaf not just that they're small, but they don't metaphysically pop. The artist has not painted them in a way that they stand out because they're part of this flow. For the Asian epic poems, we'll take the Tao Te Ching by Lao Tzu. Taoist in action. It's not that you don't do things, it's you let them happen. You help them along. So the martial arts, you use your opponent's strength against them rather than meeting them head on. In Confucianism, you conform to your social obligations, the obligations of the father to the son, the daughter to the father, the citizen to the subject to the emperor, the emperor to the subject. Everybody has a proper role. China's superhero is Monkey, who's very rambunctious and breaks things in heaven. Eventually, Buddha has to imprison him. But he is freed when he is needed. In the story of Journey to the West, he helps a monk go to India to gather Buddhist texts. And the temple form? So we'll switch over to Japan. These are Shinto shrines. So you identify a place of natural energy. And you make this little shrine here, maybe to put offerings so they won't get wet in the rain. And the Parthenon of Japan is Isi Shrine. It's all wood. This building's been there for 1,700 years. Yeah. Sort of. It rots and dissolves back into nature. Here's the green algae growing into the roof. And you build a fresh one. Every 20 years, you tear it down and rebuild it. And this is the most important shrine in Japan. This is like the Parthenon for Greece, part of this flow of nature. A home for this Asian person, Katsura Imperial Villa, for a Japanese nobleman. Integrated with nature, interpenetrating inside and outside. Very much in contrast to this Western individual standing dominating and defiant of nature. Joseph Campbell writes, throughout the Orient, the idea prevails that the ultimate ground of being transcends thought, imagining, and definition, all the things that the West bases itself on. To argue that God, man, or nature is good, just, merciful, or benign, is to fall short of the question. One could, as appropriately or inappropriately, have argued that God, man, or nature are evil, unjust, merciless, or malignant. All such anthropomorphic predications screen or mask the actual enigma, that of the ultimate ground of being of all things. So, you know, these petty involvements of, is, are we you know, doing good or bad things? Who cares in the you know, scope of nature? So the values for East Asia to achieve harmony in one's relationships, to subsume the self, to society, to the flow of nature, and to the flow of all things. Now, this is applied to Japan or China today. So we look at Japan and ask ourselves, has Japan westernized or modernized? Here's a book by the president, contemporary president of China right now. He says, the Chinese have always developed their country through studying the nature of things, correcting thoughts with sincerity, cultivating the moral self, managing the family, and safeguarding peace under heaven. So, in a harmonious world, should the American fleet be in the China Sea? No! <laughs> and they're going to get it out of there and restore harmony. So it's, it's not a pacifist philosophy. It's one of the right harmony of things. Because South Asia, this world is an illusion. Mm -hmm. It's a mistake to get, you know, one should identify with transcendent oneness 
And we can begin with, let me just take a moment, Indra's net. So Indra's net is this vast chandelier of crystals. Every crystal reflects every other crystal. So you look into one of the crystals and you will see there's one of the other crystals. And in that crystal are all of the other crystals. You start looking at um, entanglement in quantum theory and you say, oh my God, you get really strong parallels. South Asian medicine sees the flows of energy, not just within the body, but around the body. The epic Hindu poem is the Mahabharata, in which Vishnu presents to Arjuna the idea of reincarnation. Within this world, you do your duty. Arjuna says, I don't want to have this war. I have friends on both sides. He rides his chariot up and down between the two armies. And he says, well, just to, so I can get back my usurped throne, why should all these people die? Vishnu shows him, these men are already dead. You know, you don't, you're a warrior, you do your duty. The Hindu temple format. Hindu temple is a three-dimensional mandala. A mandala is a diagram of the universe, a diagram of the human mind, and a tool to use to put your mind in harmony with the universe. That's what a Hindu temple is. Buddhism is a universalization of Hinduism and presenting non-attachment as a transcendence of ego. And the Buddhist te temple form is the stupa with the layers of the world of desire, the world of form, the formless world, and the void. So these levels of uh, experience are represented here. So here are my two favorite sculptures. This is just incredible. It was in New York about 20 years ago. I got to actually see it. It's a, a um, uh, from Indonesia, Prajma Paramita, goddess of transcendent wisdom. So, how big is it? The whole thing's about that big. Um, <coughs> so this intent inner psycho, male, female, uh, eyes open, eyes closed, churning of the mind quieting of the mind. Two different cultures. So values for the East. To overcome passion, aggression, and ignorance by quieting the mind. The values of South Asia. Overcome passion, aggression, and ignorance by quieting the mind. Meditation. To reunite with transcendent oneness. So to our individual lives are like a drop of dew condensed out of the great ocean. I'm stuck on this leaf. You want to run back into the ocean and reunite with it. That ocean is transcendent consciousness. Materialism. There is only material energy and the laws that govern them. Humans are accidents of evolution. And consciousness is not real. It's emergent. It's just what happens when neurons fire. The universe is a great clockwork, and materialism run amok <laughs> is how I would interpret Richard Dawkins, uh, who presents us with a selfish gene, a gene-centered view of evolution, the God delusion, uh, that God is a delusion. He's unaware that there are religions other than the biblical religions. Consciousness is just the firing of neurons, and Cultures be understood in terms of memes, these genetic units. Total rejection of culture, art, literature, etc., as means of knowledge. Which society are you yeah. talking about with materialism? Pardon? Which, which society are you addressing? It's with its own. <laughs> I just stuck it in at the end. We're almost done. <laughs> but one of the one of the great um, 
artificial intelligence scientist is a guy named Edward Feigenbaum at Stanford. So I was at a conference. I didn't know who he was. And I started this argument with him. Uh, and I'm thinking, well, how do I deal with this guy? And so finally I said, look, you're at Stanford. Their entire departments, like literature, psychology, art, that address what is a human being besides physics and mathematics. The physicists and mathematics, having gotten into artificial intelligence, think they therefore understand, since the brain, since the human being is the brain and the brain is a digital computer, they are the science that understands human beings. So I said, there are other departments addressing this. He says, oh, you mean the fuzzies. <laughs> So I won't go through this whole diagram, but it's fun to look at Buddhism, Christianity, materialism. So Buddhism says the cosmos, all that is, is basically the interrelated consciousness of all being. Christianity says the cosmos is God, man, and nature. Materialism says the cosmos is matter, energy, and the laws of physics. Consciousness is emergent. Now let's just drop down here. Buddhism says gods are metaphors and are subject to suffering. Christianity says God is omnipotent. Materialism says God is a delusion. So the values for materialism, to remake life in the universe, to replace evolution with development, and to merge with the machine. So wrapping up, let's try this out. Here's a statement from a book by Ray Kurzweil, probably the leading futurist right now. And he just got a very dangerous uh, uh, job. Anybody know Ray Kurzweil's, Ray Kurzweil's current job? Main, main research scientist at Google. Right, right. so he has at his disposal what? I did not know that. Yeah. He's got what, maybe 100 million computers at his disposal that he can harness <laughs> to do his research on. Because this is from his earlier book. His most recent book is Building a Mind, How to Build a Mind. And he's pretty far along. But he says, it may only take a quarter of a millennium, 250 years, to go from sending messages on horseback to saturating the matter and energy of our solar system with sublimely intelligent processes, sprinkling chips all around the solar system. The ongoing expansion of our future superintelligence will then require moving out into the rest of the universe where we may engineer new universes. So there are people working on that. Um, this is a group called 2045, a group of Russian oligarchs building um, avatars into which to download themselves. Uh, this is Seth Lloyd's programming the universe, uh, how to fix it. And this is a uh, time ship where I'm, I'm director of research for time ship. It's a cryonics facility. Our clients intend to be immortal. This, we're building the research facility to make that happen. So how do we respond to this statement of uh, Ray Kurzweil? I'm gonna say it depends on our culture. If you're in the tradition of the biblical traditions of the Middle East, such aspirations distract us from our true task, submission. The pursuit of knowledge led to the expulsion from the Garden of Eden, and hubris led to the destruction of the Tower of Babel. So not a good idea, not what we're supposed to be doing. There's another argument a little bit, which is that um, our job is to understand the creator. And so if we become the creator. That sounds really dangerous. So if we become the creator by building life forms and so on. Whoa. Uh, then, he then, might then not take, appreciate He might creator. not take well to that. In South Asia, universes are continually born and continually end in fire, these great yugas. If we want to set our universe ablaze, it'll matter little in the long run. Uh, that happens all the time, every 20 millennia, you know. But it's better to renounce the fruits of action and focus on reuniting with transcendent oneness. East Asia, Lao Tzu says in the Tao Te Ching, do you think you can conquer the universe? Do you think you can improve it? I do not believe it. 
The universe is sacred. It cannot be improved. In the story of monkey, this might be okay, but only with permission, only if in service to the commune. Monkey doesn't get to act on his own. Response of materialism, of course. <laughs> Response of Greece. It was for this that Prometheus stole fire from the gods and also the arts and sciences. Our minds, our imaginations, our ambitions exist for this task, but do not believe it will change our fates. There's no escaping fate. The West. We are descendants of those who built the Gothic cathedral, circled the globe, and ventured into space. They do not accept, the Westerners don't accept modesty. They aspire to improve the universe, to set not only the universe, but themselves ablaze. But the motivation and the judgment must come from the heart of each individual. So that's my challenge to thinking. Wow, that was fantastic. Yeah. That was <laughs> Thank really you. amazing yeah. here. My, my book, Visionary, okay, Visionary Creativity is the name of the book, and it should be on Amazon within a month.